Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this time of worship. I want to welcome all those who are joining us on the web or on Facebook, and those who are listening on their phones to this service of worship this morning. It's wonderful to be with all of you and to know that your hearts are turned toward the Lord and that we're all connected by the power of the Holy Spirit today. It's a very special day in the life of the church. It's Ascension Sunday, the day that we celebrate Jesus rising up into heaven to sit on the throne and to be prepared to send the gift of the Holy Spirit to us. So as we think towards next week, we'll be celebrating the uh, festival of Pentecost. So I hope you'll be sure to also join with us next Sunday. I do have some announcements this morning. First of all, a big praise that uh, this week we had a ceremonial presenting of the check of $10,000 from Orange City Council to our Martha's Cupboard for the work of our ministry of feeding hungry people. And as I told the reporters that day, I said, you know, Jesus had compassion on the hungry and fed them. And we're here to carry on his mission of mercy and love in our community. So we have been doing that through both the office and through our mail call ministry. And this week, um, the mail call ministry served 20 guests with giving them their mail, oftentimes very important mail that they need, as well as lunch bags for them and snack bags to go along for later. We also were able to give out 27 food bags, bags of groceries and toilet paper to those who came to the church office this week. So I wanna thank you all for your prayers for this ministry, to thank the volunteers who are helping us carry it out, as well as our staff, and also to those who've been dropping off food donations and tithes. We appreciate that every one of you is an important part of this mission, and thank you so very much. I also would like to give a special word of congratulations to two college graduates uh, who just recently graduated from Stetson University. Our own music people, Christopher Hodges, our organist, and Lindsay Peterson, who offers uh, musical talent in the 9 a.m. worship playing keyboard and piano. We're so proud of you both, and we wish you all the best in all of your future plans and a special prayer for you in these uncertain times when it's hard to know just what the future looks like. But I know God has great things in store for you and we're thankful that you're continuing to be part of our music ministry here. We appreciate it greatly. Now let's pause and quiet our hearts as we enter into this time of worship.
Good morning. Before we begin our service, I just wanted to give a public service announcement. It's come to my attention that someone in the church has received a bogus text message asking them to buy gift cards for cancer patients and saying that it's coming from me. So I wanted to let you all know I'm not sending out any texts or emails asking you for money or gift cards. So if you receive those, just delete them and please do not send money. This is a scam and you may want to report it to the police if you want to. So thank you and just didn't want you to be taken in by this scam and it's definitely not from me. Join with me in our call to worship this morning, which comes from Psalm 47. Clap your hands, all you peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. God has gone up with a shout, the Lord with the sound of a trumpet. God is king over the nations. God sits on his holy throne. Sing praises to God, sing praises. Sing praises to our King, sing praises. first reading this morning comes from St. Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 24 to 28. This will be a very familiar text and maybe a favorite text for many of you. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. We know that in all things, God works for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Hello, children. It's wonderful to be able to spend a little time with you today. I really miss seeing you in person but I wanted to invite you today to come into my office and I'm going to share with you a Bible story that we're going to be talking about in our worship today. 
It's a story about Jesus saying goodbye to his dear, dear friends when he went back up into heaven. You know, he had been risen from the dead and spent time with them, but now they went up to a beautiful place in the mountains and Jesus told them that God was going to send them something special, the Holy Spirit. And so they saw him lift up into heaven and out of sight. Well, none of us have gotten to see Jesus right up close in person, but by the Holy Spirit, we know his love and he lives in our hearts. And I thought about how I keep the picture of my loved ones close in my heart when I can't be with them right now. And one of the ways is through pictures. Last night we got to talk to our daughter Ruth on the phone and she's in Australia far, far away. But yet we could still talk to her and feel her presence and we prayed together and we felt very, very close to her. Well, throughout the many centuries since Jesus left the earth and went to heaven, people in different places have had pictures of him that would remind them of what Jesus was like and his love for them. And I love this little picture that I have in my office here. It's a picture of Jesus and his friends. Can you see they're having communion together, the Last Supper together? And this picture was made by an artist in El Salvador in Central America. But all the people around the table look different, don't they? And many places that we've lived, the pictures of Jesus that artists make are people that look like me. Because now Jesus' spirit lives within each of us no matter who we are or where we live. He is with us and he lives with us. So I wanted to remind you that Jesus is always present with you and that he loves you and he's with you. Even when you can't be in church, he's with you in your home. And I remind myself by looking at pictures of my family that even though we can't all be together, our spirits are united and our love holds us close to one another. So just remember today that Jesus loves you and I love you. And even though I can't be right there with you, I'm sending you a big hug. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you that even though we can't see you, we love you. And we know your love surrounds us. And we look forward to one day that we will all be together in heaven with you. And we thank you for our children and ask you to bless them today. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall be fitted, all serve.
Our second scripture for this morning is the beginning of Luke's second book, the book of the Acts of the Apostles, beginning at chapter 1. We're outside today because this story takes place outside, so you can feel the sense of what it would be like for the disciples in this moment. Hear now the word of God. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up into heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you've heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus replied, It is not for you to know the times and the periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who's been taken up from you into heaven, will come again in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. When they had entered the city, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot and Judas son of James. All these were constantly devoting themselves to prayer, together with certain women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, as well as his brothers. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In the Old Testament book of 2 Kings, the second chapter, We read the story of the great prophet Elijah and how he was taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot. It also tells about his faithful assistant, Elisha, who witnessed it all. And beforehand, Elijah had asked him, what can I do for you before I go? Maybe he needed an extra prophet lesson or a donkey. But Elisha wisely answered him, Please let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. That was the inheritance he wanted. And so as he watched Elijah be carried up into heaven, Elijah's cloak fell from the chariot and Elisha picked it up and put it on, a symbol that he was carrying on the mission of being a witness of God's power and presence. Well, in this opening of Luke's second book, The Acts of the Apostles, we see a similar scene. The leave taking of Jesus, a great prophet and more, our savior, as he leaves and departs from his faithful followers who will be called to carry on his mission. Since his death and resurrection, 
They have rejoiced in his presence. But now he's going? Wait, what? After he's out of sight, they just stand there staring into the sky. They're frozen in time and in grief. Can you imagine their sense of grief and loss? We had Jesus with us and now he's gone. It kind of reminds me of how Mary Magdalene, when she saw the risen Lord, wanted to hold on to him, hold on to the past, the relationship, the way things were before. But as they're staring up into the sky, the angels bring them back to the present and say, why are you standing there staring into the sky? Don't you know? He will be coming back just the same way. And I think there's an implied message here. By the way, didn't he tell you what you were supposed to be doing? They, like we, are called to remember the promises of Jesus. And what he told them, wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Even in the times of great loss and grief that they were feeling, their futures so uncertain, Jesus assures them that God has something good in store for them. God's promises are always good and often better than we can even imagine, better than the present that we want to hold on to. As our reading from Romans that Paul read earlier says, in all things, God is at work for good for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. I was thinking that sometimes God gives us waiting time and we waste it instead of using it to grow closer to him and to try to see his purpose for our life more clearly. We often waste it fretting or complaining or worrying, which is my bad, questioning or wanting to know more. Like the disciples said, hey Jesus, is this the time now for everything to be restored, for the big ending, the finale, where we get to be in charge? But Jesus tells them, no, it's not for you to know the times. That's God's business. But here's what I want you to do. Stay together, go to Jerusalem and wait for what I've promised you. We want to know when the waiting will be over. Jesus wants us to know him and to become more like him, no matter what the circumstances. To use the waiting time well, to stay together and spend much time in prayer. I love how Paul puts it in Romans 12, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Isn't this a timely message for us today? I love Jesus' last words. You don't get to know the time, but when you receive power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, the country of your enemies, and to the ends of the earth, everywhere, near and far. You will be my witnesses. This is another promise that God is in control, but we will get power to be witnesses. What a vision. It's our invitation from Jesus too. The Greek word for witness which is martus, from which comes the word martyr, implies sacrificing something, risking, voluntarily suffering for witnessing to our faith and belief. Webster gives several meanings to it. To witness is to give evidence or personal knowledge of something. A witness is one who's asked to be present to tell the truth about what happened. 
and to witness, to be a witness, is to make a public affirmation by word and example of one's faith and beliefs. You know, every day we witness to something. Jesus wants them to be his witnesses, witnesses of his life and his love. As I thought about witnesses, I remembered some wonderful missionaries that we supported in one of our churches in Ohio, the Edmistons. They were sent to witness to the ends of the earth. They spent 20 years in Papua New Guinea in a remote area with a small tribal group that had never heard the Bible and didn't have the Bible in their own language. They were witnesses with their lives and their love for this group of people by living with them for 20 years. And it was many, many years before they could even speak the word. Finally, at the end of the 20 years of living in community and understanding the language and the ways and the hearts of these people, the Edmistons were able to present to them for the first time the New Testament in their own language. They were part of the Wycliffe Bible Translators mission. And they came to speak at our church and they showed us a video of the celebration of this tribe receiving God's word in their native tongue. It was the biggest parade you could imagine. Everyone dressed up in their most festive costumes, singing and dancing, and held high on a stand above their heads was the word of God, their treasure. I'll never forget it. It made me appreciate what a gift God's word is to us. And we take it for granted so often. But what a witness, to witness with your lives before you can even speak the language. They came to know Jesus through the love of these missionaries for their community. You see, our lives of faithful love day by day, near and far, are a witness there are witness that Jesus and his spirit lives within us, no matter the circumstances. Think of the early church and the persecutions they faced. They did indeed risk their lives for their witness. But how are we witnesses? Well, Paul writes that there is spiritual fruit that's evident in our lives when the Holy Spirit is living in us. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, gentleness, self-control. This is part of our witness. Fruits that grow from this gift of the Father, this promise, His Holy Spirit coming into our lives. You see, Jesus is no longer physically in sight, but through his spirit, each of us are separately living in him. I wonder if you relate to this story at all. I know I kept feeling parts of it personally. I thought about how much our being together physically in worship was the main way that we have in the past experienced Jesus' presence among us, a physical presence, and the joy of my physical presence with you, and how we're all grieving the loss of that, and how I especially grieve the loss of physical presence within this community as I look towards retiring. In this time of separation, maybe we too are grieving just like the followers of Jesus, and that's okay. We have to go through that time before we can be ready. That's part of the waiting that he gives us, that we can be prepared for the new things that God wants to do in our lives. But as the angel said, don't be stuck looking back to what we had, or frozen looking up to the sky 
Like the disciples, we're in an uncertain time, a waiting time. We want to know when these hard times will be over. But the promise of the Father is for us, too. The Holy Spirit is our gift, connecting us, connecting us to God, and connecting us to one another, even when we're physically separated. We experienced that, especially when we spent three years in Africa without a phone or a TV or a way to communicate with our families. But through prayer and God's Spirit, we had a closeness, we had a connection with them. And Paul writes, the Spirit prays along with us, with our groans and sighs, when we don't have words to express our grief. And we know that in all things, God is at work to bring good. That's a promise from him. Jesus has gone from their sight and from ours too. He said it would be better for us if he went because now his spirit is everywhere, always working to bring good for us, always doing a new thing, but unchanging in faithful love. I want to share this verse from James, which is one of my favorites, James 1.17. Every generous act of giving with every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. God's gifts are always good and God's love never changes. We can rely upon that as our foundation. So like the early disciples, let's stick together. Let's spend lots of time in prayer. Let's use our waiting time to read and treasure the words of scripture, to come to know Jesus more and more by spending time in the gospels, reading about his life, asking his life to sink into ours asking help to become more like Jesus so that even today we can be his witnesses in our homes, in our community, in our state, in our country, and to the ends of the earth. And to God be the glory. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, even though you're out of our sight now, we feel the presence of your spirit, and we thank you that you're with us. Help your spirit to guide and direct us in these uncertain times, and may we feel and know that your love is present always. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our affirmation of faith this morning is the historic Apostles' Creed, and I invite you to recite it with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. For our prayer time this morning, we're going to light some candles and then hear a special prayer that I've adapted from one of my favorite books of prayers by Ted Loder. It's called Gorillas of Grace. Not like the animal gorilla, but gorillas, underground warriors. 
uh, on behalf of God's grace. So we'll hear a little part of that. But first, we're going to light some candles as a sign of our prayers for different people and groups of people. So let us pray. Gracious God of love, we come into your presence and offer prayers on behalf of others. We lift up a prayer now for our church and our church family, that you would be with each and every one as we're in different places, but united by your Holy Spirit. We pray for our community here in Orange City, especially those who are suffering, grieving, who've lost jobs or struggling, and for our homeless friends. Lord, we lift up all of our community workers, those who are out working each day to care for the sick, to care for our needs for food and shelter, to care for the public safety and first responders. Lord, surround them with your loving care. We lift up our country, Lord, for its leaders, that they might be wise and that you would protect their health. We lift up the world, the world that God so loved that he sent his son. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are in other places that don't have the resources that we do, that we too might be willing to share and help them. We lift up all those who are sick this day, suffering in any way, or who are in the hospital battling coronavirus. Lord, may your healing presence be with them. We pray for those who are grieving, who have lost loved ones, who have lost jobs, who have lost their normal life pattern. We pause now, God, to just lift up our own individual needs, those things that are most pressing on our hearts that we lift to you silently now or spoken out loud in our homes. For all children, we lift them up to you, O oh God, and especially those who are graduating from high school and college in a different way than they expected. Lord, may they know their future is filled with hope because of you. We thank you today for Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and ask that you'd help us to follow you more closely. And we give thanks today for the gift of life, new life, new babies that have been born and are growing and will come to know your love. And now we hear these words, a prayer for us to appreciate this day. Oh God, let something essential happen to me something more than interesting or entertaining in these unusual times. Oh God, let something essential happen to me, something awesome, something real. Speak to my condition, Lord, and change me somewhere inside where it matters, a change that will burn and tremble and heal. O oh God, in this waiting time, let something essential and joyful happen in me now, something like the blooming of hope and faith, like a grateful heart, like a surge of awareness of how precious each moment is. That now, not next time or later, now is the occasion to take off my shoes, to see every bush on fire, to leap and dance, to share love and kindness, to breathe in the air until I've drunk enough to dare to speak the tender words. 
Thank you. I love you. You're beautiful. I'm sorry. I forgive you. Remember me, O oh God, I am yours. Let something happen in me now, O oh God, which is my real self alive in your love. Amen. Throughout the course of the pandemic, you have been so unbelievably generous as we have worshiped in the safety of our own homes. We come now to the time of our tithes and offerings, and we invite you to continue in that same spirit of generosity. We are serving so many more people these days, people who are in desperate need oftentimes, and these gifts make a big difference.
pray with me now. O oh Lord God, we thank you for generous hearts, for glad hearts and the spirit of giving. In these difficult times, we thank you for so many who have given so generously out of their hearts. Thank you for these gifts. Help them to be used so that others might know that you are good. You are our God and a God of love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. and joy as you trust in him, as you look up to him, so that you too may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go forth in peace and joy to be his witnesses. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.